Hi there, everyone. My name is Priyak Chithani, and today we're going to be going over the importance of right heart catheterizations, which is a very complex topic, but I think it's something that's going to come up in medical school, as well as your intern year, especially in internal medicine, or if you end up doing cardiology. And understanding this in a very simplistic way, sooner rather than later, can actually go a very long way in helping you understand the etiology of cardiogenic shock and differentiating cardiogenic shock from other types of shock. So that's going to be the point of today's video. So with that being said, I want to first go into the basics of right heart catheterization, but the credit for today's talk actually goes to an incredible fellow um, here at Stanford. I'm a second year internal medicine resident at Stanford, and um, the gentleman here, Muhammad Fazl, is actually one of the cardiology fellows at Stanford and also an alum of our program. He actually taught me right heart cats, and I thought I would take some of what he taught me and try to convey it to everyone here. Um, the disclaimer here is kind of the important part, right? This is a very tough topic and has a very high cognitive load. So even if you're struggling with this, I want to reassure you that it's not something that comes easily to anyone. It's going to require a lot of understanding, including understanding what a right heart cath is. There's a lot of small numbers you need to understand. But if there's anything you walk away with today, it's just understanding some of the numbers and I'm going to try to walk you through all of the basics. Um, we're going to do a 30,000 foot overview and we're going to take it one step at a time. But don't be too hard on yourself if you don't get it right away. Sometimes a lot of this does take practice. So now, let's go ahead and actually talk about what actually is a right heart cath. This is often referred to if someone has the catheter for a right heart in their body, it's usually referred to as a swan catheter, so you may also see it referred to that way. But ultimately, what a right heart cath is, is that they put in a catheter, essentially, um, into your veins, right? And it goes all the way down into your right atrium, then to your right ventricle, and then eventually into your pulmonary arteries. So notice how this requires you to understand your underlying physiology and anatomy of the heart. Sometimes it goes from usually a central line, but usually as long as you can get to the right atrium and right ventricle, you will be able to get a right heart cath. And as you're doing each of these things, there are transducers on the catheter that allow you to measure the pressure in specific regions of the heart. So as as you get near the right atrium, you'll be able to measure the uh, pressure in the right atrium. You will then be able to measure the pressure in the right ventricle. You will also ultimately be able to measure the pressure in the pulmonary artery. And this seems very complex. Um, so the way I like to break it down is to draw it in a line because the heart obviously is not in a single line, but the, the flow is, is to a certain extent linear because things follow each other. So as I said, you get a catheter uh, from either the superior or inferior vena cava. It then goes into your right atrium. From right atrium, it goes through the uh, tricuspid valve into your right ventricle. And then from the right ventricle, it goes into the um, lungs. And then from the lungs, it can often go into the left atrium. The catheter doesn't all the way doesn't go all the way to the left atrium, but the whole point is that this is a flow, right? And at each of these points, I drew a little circle because I, I want you to know that you can measure the pressure at each of these points. You can get a right atrial pressure in an active right heart cath. You can get a right ventricular pressure in a right heart cath. And then ultimately, you're going to get a systolic and diastolic pressure in the lungs, right? Notice how we have a systolic and diastolic pressure in our systemic circuit, right? When we measure our blood pressure and you know how everyone's supposed supposed to have 120 over 80, you'll do the same thing with the right heart cath in the lung vasculature. You'll get a systolic and diastolic in the lung, vas lung vasculature. And then by the time you get through, um, get to a lung vasculature, you can often have a, um, what's called um, a wedge that you can blow up and you can get a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And you do that usually by uh, blowing up a small tube and that tube occludes a pulmonary artery, a very small part of it, um, or pulmonary capillary. And so when it occludes that, you can actually get a wedge pressure, which I'm going to go into what exactly that means, but it essentially is a proxy for the left atrial pressure because when you blow up that, um, that bubble, essentially, in the uh, pulmonary capillary, you'll be able to occlude that entire capillary and, and the pressure will be only measured distal to that um, um, occlusion you just made, and that will essentially be the left atrial pressure um, as a proxy, and we usually call that the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So here are the things that you're going to get from a right heart cath. You're going to put a catheter in. You'll be able to measure the right atrial pressure. You'll be able to measure the right, right ventricular pressure. Um, you'll be able to measure the systolic and diastolic pressure of the lungs. And usually you'll get into a capillary in the lungs, um, the, in the lung vasculature, and you will be able to blow up um, what you will see is like the 
uh, I think, I don't know what the t proper term is, but you'll be able to blow up essentially like a tube within the capillary and that tube will occlude the capillary and you'll have a transducer distal to that tube and it will measure the pressure distal to that tube. And because nothing is going past your occlusion, you're essentially measuring the pressure of the left atrium because what happens after the capillaries and lungs, it's directly the left atrium. And that's why when you blow up that tube and you're occluding the pulmonary capillary and you're creating a wedge, you are essentially getting a proxy for the left atrial pressure. That is ultimately what you're going to get with a right heart cath. There's a very interesting thing that you can also get with a right heart cath. You can also measure a cardiac output. I'm not going to go into why or how you can measure this. It's actually fascinating, but it's beyond the scope of today. But I want you to know that when you get a right heart cath, you're going to be looking for a few numbers. The right atrial pressure, right ventricular pressure, pulmonary capillary veg pressure, the lung pressures, including the um, systolic and diastolic um, lung pressures. And then ultimately, if you need it, you can also get a cardiac output. And so why did I bring you through all of this? The reason I brought you through all of this is because I want you to know that you're going to get this information anytime you get a right heart catheterization. And that's what's present here on the right side of on on your left side of the screen. Um, and then once you have this information, I want you to ask yourself three questions. Always ask these three questions anytime you get a right heart cath because it will make your life much easier. And those three questions are, are there elevated pulmonary artery pressures? Yes or no? It's going to be very easy for you to answer once you know what the normal is. The second one is, is the cardiac output decreased? Notice that I told you you can get the cardiac output from a right heart cath, so I want you to tell me if it's decreased. And the third thing you want me to, you want to tell me is, is the patient wet or dry? And this is going to be based, obviously, on your physical exam. If someone has crackles, lower extremity edema, elevated JVD, that's a sign that a patient is wet because they clearly have uh, evidence of um, vasculature overload with fluid, right? But you can also measure if someone is wet or dry from a purely pressure standpoint because if the person is wet, their right atrium is going to have elevated pressures because everything that ends up coming back from your body goes to the right atrium. And if you are wet, that means that the right atrium is facing a lot of large pressures and stuff is backing up and causing a lot of congestion. Okay. So those are all the things I want you to answer the three things. And when you answer those three things, you'd be very surprised, but life's going to get pretty, pretty good. Um, so let's start with an example because this always makes things a bit easier. I want to start with a normal physiology. If you did a right heart catheterization in me or someone who has normal physiology and is not in cardiogenic shock, um, these are very good numbers for everyone to know. I want you to know a normal right atrial pressure, which is usually between 0 to 8 millimeters of mercury. Then I want you to know a normal pulmonary artery pressure. If the systolic and diastolic is usually 30 over 15. More importantly, the mean pulmonary artery pressure is usually the same thing as the MAP, which we have in the systemic vasculature, which is one-third the systolic pulmonary artery pressure plus two-thirds of the diastolic pulmonary artery pressure. And usually the, all, um, the average um, pressure that you should see in the pulmonary artery should be less than 25. So when I ask you if someone has elevated pulmonary artery pressures, I want you to look at this number, and if it's higher than 25, that's usually a sign that they do have elevated pulmonary artery pressures. Then a pulmonary capillary veg pressure is often a pressure... Um, proxy for the left atrium. And usually it should be left less than 15. And it makes sense because if you look at the pressure flow, usually things go from high pressures to low pressures. So starting at pulmonary artery, you'll usually have 30. And as you get to the left atrium, you should be around 15 by the time you get out. And lastly, you should look at your cardiac output. A normal cardiac output, which is stroke volume times heart rate, is usually four to eight liters per minute. That's the total amount of blood that's going to be flowing. Um, and this is normal physiology. Um, if a patient is a patient wet or dry, I told you that the way we're going to determine that is by looking at the right atrial pressure. If the right atrial pressure is elevated, it's usually a sign that the patient is wet because that means that there's a lot of stuff backing up. Okay, so now let's do an example here. Um, if I told you we have a patient with the right atrial pressure, we do a right heart cath and we see that the right atrial pressure is 25. We see the pulmonary artery pressure is 45 over 23 with a mean of around 34. And we see the capillary wedge pressure is 22. And we see the cardiac output is 2.1. Let's ask ourselves these three questions. Are there elevated pulmonary artery pressures? Feel free to pause the video, but yes, there are, right? Uh, you can see that the pressure in the pulmonary artery is 34, clearly higher than 25. The second question I'm asking is, is the cardiac output decreased? Yes, it's definitely decreased because usually you're between 4 to 8 and it's 2.1. And the third one is, is the patient wet or dry? 
Well, in this case, I think the patient is wet, right? Because the right atrial pressure is very very high. Obviously, you want to now overlap this with your physical exam. Does the patient have lower extremity edema? Does the patient have elevated JVD? Does the patient have um, any evidence of you know hepatojugular reflex? Those are all things that you can look for on your physical exam to suggest signs of volume overload. Now, now that you have these three things, it kind of, you can start putting these things together. Patient has a decreased cardiac output, right? So maybe they have some level of cardiogenic issues. You can't say that they're in shock um, unless you have a lactate or signs of an organ damage. But let's say I told you that they did have a lactate and they clearly were short of breath and they clearly are having issues. Then um, at this point, I would also see that, oh, well, they're clearly wet because they're volume up. So at that point, I think the physiology here would be cardiogenic shock from a wet wet standpoint, right? Now, let's do the same example again. And notice how based on all of this, you were able to like basically suss out a very, very tough case based on the right heart cath numbers. And that's why these numbers can be really helpful. Let's do an example before we kind of round out this video, which can be very tough. Let's say you have a right atrial pressure of seven. You have a pulmonary artery pressure of 35 over 20, a pulmonary capillary veg pressure of 19, and a cardiac output again of 2.1. So ask yourselves the three questions again. Are there elevated pulmonary artery pressures? Yes. Is the cardiac output decreased? Yes. But is the patient wet or dry? And in this case, you'll notice that the right atrial pressure is actually 7 and not 10. So I'd actually say the patient seems kind of okay, if not like exquisitely dry. They may not be dry, but I'd say the patient is definitely not wet. Now let's say I told you the patient still has an elevated lactate. Let's say I told you the patient's clearly still having mild shortness of breath, um, clearly having an elevated creatinine, uh, signs of inorganic damage. Well, then in that case, this could then show you that this patient likely has cardiogenic shock still, but the patient's probably more dry. So you may not diurese this patient like you would this patient, but um, you want to address it in other ways, such as decreasing afterload, and you want to increase ionotropy, obviously, for these patients. So this is kind of what I wanted to go through today, because right heart cats can be very, very tough. But if you ask yourself these three questions, and you'll see these informations, and you know how you're getting this information, you can actually elucidate a lot of very tough physiology, just purely based on numbers. So hopefully you all enjoyed this video. If you did, drop a like, comment, share, subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.